Luke 2, verse 6 through 7 states, And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. God had this master plan. Make that a messy plan. He was going to save the world. And to do so, he was going to send his son. Where does the God of the universe send his son? Where does the King of kings and Lord of lords come? To a barn, a stable, a manger of all places. Certainly no place fit for a king. But then again, this wasn't any ordinary king. When I say it was messy, I mean it was messy. It was a barn, a stable. So you've got animals and animal stuff, dirty hay and mud, a pitiful place for people, much less a king of kings to be born. Why did God do that? Well, I can't tell you for sure because the prophet Isaiah tells us that his thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. You see, Jesus came to a messy place. A barn, well, yes, that's messy. But Jesus came to a messy world. Why? Because the shepherd was coming to take care of his sheep and to prepare a way for his sheep to come home. He lives where the sheep are. He sleeps where they sleep, and he eats where they eat because that's what a shepherd does. Chapter 2 reads, An angel appeared to the shepherds in the field and said, Do not be afraid. I'll bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in cloth, lying in a manger. A sign. Do you ever wonder what that sign was? A sign for what? Maybe it was a sign that Jesus is accessible to everyone. A sign that the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills can relate to all of us, even a homeless person. Because on this earth, Jesus never had a home either. He never had a place to rest his head. Mm, maybe it was a sign that God would have nothing to do with the social status of mankind. A sign that the fame and fortune that so many humans strive for would not be a striving desire. A sign that he detests the splendor of humans because it's just not worthy of him. It clearly was a sign that those who Jesus would later walk with and for us here tonight, that if the Lord of the heavens and the earth would choose to lead a humble life, then we should also follow in his steps. It most certainly was a sign of how far our Heavenly Father would go to enter into our lowly and messy lives.
The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Philippians, in the second chapter, we should have the same attitude of Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, becoming a servant, being made in human likeness. You see, being a servant is messy, and Jesus set this incredible example for us. I mean, he got down on his knees and washed feet. The God of the universe, the God who deserved the best of everything, got on his knees and used his hands to wipe the very dirt he had created from the feet of his disciples. He is the God who came into the world and was laid in a manger, a place for animals feet. Of all places, why such a messy place? Because he was following a messy plan. So, needless to say, that very first Christmas was dirty. It was gross, it was filthy, but thank God it was, because without it, what a mess we'd be in. Grace to you and peace from God, our Heavenly Father, and from the Lord Jesus. Amen. We decorate our homes and our sanctuary this season, and rightly so. Our decorating reminds us and those around us that we are celebrating something special, a unique event in our year, and it's beautiful. I love Christmas decorating, as I'm sure many of you do as well. Here in our church, It always feels like our sanctuary is uplifted uh, for this very special season. My wife Mary and I were talking the other day, and all the years that we have lived here in the parsonage next door, our Christmas decorating has remained essentially the same because we love the way it transforms our home for this celebration. When I was a boy, my family and I, we used to drive around uh, through the neighborhood to see all of the houses decorated with colored lights, and I have to admit, uh, I still love to do it today. Well, taken all together, we create this kind of atmosphere of orderly beauty, where the, the twinkling of the lights, the candles we light, the trees that we decorate, all create a kind of message that seems to say, Everything is right with the world. And so just as we start hanging ornaments on the tree, putting lights on our homes, our middle school students come alongside us and say, wait a minute, it was messy. It was a messy plan. There was nothing neat, nothing beautiful and tidy about what actually happened when our Lord came into this world. Births are messy. Stables are messy. And yet that is precisely how God chose to enter this world, this time, this history of ours. And it seems to be in such tremendously sharp contrast from the kind of Christmas environment that we're trying to create for ourselves. What I so appreciate about our students' message is their invitation for us to be honest. Because we often do with our lives what we do occasionally in our sanctuaries and in our homes, and that is we try to dress them up. We dress them up in such a way as to be able to overlook the mess that is going on right in here. We try to convince ourselves, perhaps, that we can just leave the churchy stuff in church. And what I mean by that is we unpack the story, like we unpack our decorations, and then we we put them all up. We tell the story again, we listen to the familiar Bible passages, we sing the familiar carols, and when it's all over, we pack it up, we put it away. And then perhaps you think to yourself, maybe say out loud, well, that was nice. It's so very tempting to put that kind of exterior on our own lives and think perhaps that I don't really need what we just celebrated on a day-to-day basis. I don't really need that story. I don't really need God in my life. Because, well, I'm fine. 
And that exterior can be like our decorations. Looks pretty. It can be distracting for a time, maybe even for a long while, but it can't be there forever. Because at the very heart and soul truth of this life is our need for God to be in our daily lives, to find a way into our brokenness, our messiness. Because it will encroach upon every one of our lives at different times, different ways. In fact, it'll do so often. The brokenness encroaches at the death of one that perhaps you love dearly. It encroaches upon us when we suffer from health concerns for ourselves or those we love. The messiness of life seems to take over in the shadow of broken relationships, and there are a myriad of other ways in which it all seems to come unglued. Those things happen when we walk away, either accidentally or maybe even intentionally, from what God has in mind. The truth is, we need to recognize God's great desire to come into the messiness of our lives and make his home with us. No amount of decorating that we do in our churches, that we do in our homes, that we do on ourselves, will ever change that fundamental truth. We need God to come, just as he did. I don't know where you are in life today. Maybe you have convinced yourself that you are content with the decorating that you've been able to do in your own life to kind of fend off those problems, those realities. Or maybe you do have that deep sense of longing for God's presence in your life. Well, God alone knows what is truly in your own heart. And he chose this messy plan as a kind of foreshadowing for the even messier, gruesome plan when Jesus would carry all of our brokenness upon himself and he would take all of that to the cross. And there, the perfect, sinless Son of God would bear all of that sin, all of that brokenness and burden for our sake even to the point of his own death. But as we know, that plan continues, and that plan leads to resurrection, and resurrection leads to new life. And eventually, the Lord, the perfect Son of God, returned back to the Father and prepared a place, a place to which he will call all of us, a place that isn't, messy and broken, but is pure and perfect. All of that life, the death, the resurrection, all of it, Jesus experienced for our sake, so that God could come and meet us where we really are. Above all, our Lord wants to bring the beauty of his love into your own heart. And that's not window dressing. That's not temporary decorating. That is a permanent, enduring, eternal promise of love that God wants to just pour out upon all of us, not just in this season of glitter and lights, but always, in every season, in every day, in every moment of every life. He wants to look past the trappings, the excuses, the facades, the pretending that we do, and truly meet us where we are. Into all of that reality, God comes to us again this day, and he says, Fear not, for I have come for you. May that promise and that assurance 
be the truest beauty that you experience again this Advent and Christmas season. God's blessings. Amen. Lord Jesus, born a refugee into this messy world. Lord Jesus, friend of the poor and lover of the outcast. Lord Jesus, provider of all good things. Jesus Christ, Savior of the world. Jesus Christ, bringer of hope and good news. Jesus Christ, Son of God. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us also to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, in the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Through this Advent season, through the celebration of Christmas, into the new year and beyond, may our Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.